Hello and welcome to this evening's SUFC uh, stream. I hope you're having a, a very good Friday night so far. And I'll tell you what, it's just about to get even better tonight as we are joined this evening by Mickey Joyce, a Sutton legend. He scored so many goals and has so many tales to tell. Um, so I'll be calling him in one sec. Uh, I'm just going to let you guys know, um, again, we just want to apologise for last night's uh, stream. Uh, there were some technical difficulties with that, so uh, I, I do apologise uh, for that, but hopefully it's sorted now. Put in the live chat your questions for Mickey or the general comments, and obviously let me know if there is any problems uh, regarding the audio or the picture. So I hope you guys uh, really enjoy this one. I certainly am looking forward to talking to Mickey. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to give uh, Mickey a call now. Hello. Hi, Mickey. Hello, John. How are you doing? I'm, I'm good, thanks. Uh, are you having a good evening so far? Yeah, I'm well. I was, I was having a good evening. I was talking to, uh, I was unfortunately talking to, to Dave Fairbrother, Rob, Rob Oak, Shane, Adrian Barry, Steve Millington, and Mark Kidd and Tina. <laughs> so they're a bit <laughs> on Zoom at the moment. Well, let's, uh, let's get straight into this. Um, firstly, uh, firstly, Mickey. Um, how did you get into football as a young kid? So we're going to go right back here. Um, yeah, so when did your love affair with football start? Well, it all started, I suppose, back in when I was like the uh, cup football, which is age of seven, I suppose, when uh, my dad took me down to local park. That's where I started playing, so that's got me into the game. So, yeah. Excellent. Um, so, was it true that you were a supporter of, of Sutton, uh, Sutton United uh, before you signed for the club? Um, yes, I was actually. Um, the um, your dad was a Chelsea man because he come from out that way, Kings Road, and uh, he um, <clears throat> moved down this way. And the local club was was Sutton, so he took us to Sutton, and that's where I first went to uh, see a game of football, and uh, that was cool. Must be about the same sort of age, really. So yeah, Sutton was my first club. Uh, can you tell us some some of your early memories of supporting Sutton United? Um, yeah, I suppose getting to the game. I always remember going to the game and in in the, the crowd. Then even I think they were all supported side actually, and uh, you could hear the the crowd chanting before the game and that. So from being a bit of a youngster, it was a bit of a experience but uh, yeah I can't remember very much about the players then because that age is sort of you know you're just watching the game and you don't sort of take in the names of them until you can. but uh, yeah it was good it was the atmosphere of it really um so we're going to get on now for you signing for the club how did that uh, all come about oh hello Mickey yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I'll ask that question again. Um, when you, I'm just going to go on to signing for the club. How did that all come about? Oh, sorry, guys. It seems we're having some difficulties here, at Mickey. Here. Hello, Mickey. Hello. Sorry about this, guys. Oh, technology, it's done me over a second night in a row. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, sorry, Mickey, I'm having trouble um, hearing you there. Oh, yeah, that's all right, don't worry. Uh, yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, so I'll ask that question once again. Po apologies for the views. Um, yet, uh, so get, getting to signing for Sutton, how did that all come about? Um, I think, cool, that was back in 77, um, where... John Shears, who was a Sutton player, played with him at Woodmanston, uh, Uncle Crush, used to call him, and uh, he suggested I go down to Sutton, so he took me down there, and uh, at the uh, first meeting with um, the iconic Ken Island, would you believe, and uh, he brought me into the, because I was about 18 then, I think, um, and um, went to play 
youth team game. That was the first game played. And um, they pretty well signed me straight after. It was a bit of a naive sort of player as such, because it was new to me, all this, playing in a bit of a stadium, playing from Woodmanston. So that was, that was my first uh, experience. And then Ken, and I, there was another fellow there who's been my mate ever since, is Martin Clark. And he frankly joined on the same day, and he, he was at Banston, at Banston Athletic. So um, that sort of cemented our relationship for some reason. I've uh, known him ever since. That best man for his wedding and vice versa for mine. So lasting relationship there. Um, so who were the big characters in the squad uh, when you were first coming through? Well, the manager was Alan Pintergast at the time. And... Um, the side was struggling a little bit and really you couldn't sort of identify um, many established players. I think uh, the club's going through a bit of a transition. So at the time, I think I remember when I went down there that there was talk of a new manager coming and that was uh, Keith Blunt. And uh, it's no sort of uh, um, easy ride for anyone with his, his previous experience. As, as such, and uh, it's, um, he, he would be a, a challenge for the club. He's very much a disciplinarian, so everyone knew where they were going to stand. And uh, I thought if anyone was going to find me out, that would be Keith Blunt. But uh, he took over then, and that's when he started to bring in players, um, which would give a bit of stability to the club. That was experienced players, but he also had some youngsters there, which, like myself, and uh, Tony Raines, uh, Ricky Stevens. Um, they had, I think Gavin was there, Gavin Fraser. The supporters may know of him from his past. So he was starting to build or look to build a new, a new side. So the players were, you know, not established, but he certainly started to to build the team and certainly around the older players. I think John Raines might have been there then. Uh, he may have been, I can't, I'm pretty sure John just started then, um, so he was still a relative youngster anyway. Um, but um, that, that's really when it all started for me anyway. Um, so a couple of questions have uh, come in for you on the live chat. Firstly from James King, where was your favourite place to stand at Gander Green Lane? Um, in the shoebox. Over the other side, I think, yeah, that's where I started to stand and watch a few games when I went. Um, didn't, didn't go a, a, an awful lot, but um, that's where I go. That was a good viewpoint for me. Excellent. Um, another question's come from uh, Sahil Sai. Uh, was there in, any in particular songs uh, sung about you? Sahil thinks uh, uh, one of them might be in Oh Mickey, you're so fine. Oh, you blow my mind, Oh Mickey. Is that, is that one that. Um, <laughs> That was something about you, Mickey. Someone set him up for that one, yeah. <laughs> I think I told him about that one. No, I think no, there wasn't any songs like that at all. The, uh, there was the usual, uh, I think, um, if anything, there might have been Mickey taking songs, but uh, no, there's nothing like that at all. Uh, so you made your senior debut in the 1977-78 season, uh, and he scored yeah. in uh, each of the last two games that season. How did that feel? That, that must have been great coming to the side yeah. and doing that. Yeah, I remember uh, that was um, a, a big thing for me. That um, I think that first game um, was against Leatherhead, um, which um, was at Leatherhead, and I remember Ricky Kidd, who uh, played up front again, um, didn't take full slightly, and uh, he, he led the front there that day, and. I got on well straight away with Rick actually and I think um, I scored that game and I made one for him. Uh, I think he got an overhead bicycle kick head goal actually. Second game was at Wickham Wanderers um, which was Keith Blunt's old team and he was manager at the time and I remember uh, playing up there and I scored there as well which was good. I think I always remember afterwards that um, there was I wasn't getting paid, I know the other players were. And I remember them might be going around the changing room saying, has anyone got any couple of quid? Got a couple of quid. I can't understand why I thought we don't pay subs or anything. 
and he kept asking Carol Platt and a few of the other people, so got some money, come over to me, said, here I son, take that. <laughs> oh, thanks, what's that? I don't really want that, Keith. He's, he said, no, no, take it, take it. I think what he was trying to say is that <laughs> you don't let you go anywhere. Here's some money. I think he was towards the end of the season then as well. And he said, uh, no, no, take that. It was only about tenner. But I think he just felt, but it's quite funny actually because he was going around asking for a couple of quid. He was quite good as a manager like that, I suppose. Draw off the players, whatever you are. So that was my, you know, first two experiences of uh, playing in the first team. Uh, Sean Donnelly asked in the live chat, uh, Joycey, have you put any quizzes together while in lockdown? <laughs> I've got loads set up actually, mainly music quizzes, but I'm trying to find out how to do it on Zoom. But uh, once I get it done, yeah, it'll be put around to everyone. So, yeah, they're in, they're in the pipeline. So next I want to move on to um, the Anglo-Italian Cup success uh, you guys had. Can you talk me through in depth about the experience of, of winning that competition and the whole experience of, of, of travelling with that great team as well? Cool, yeah, that was um, that was the end of the experience. That was, I think, Andy Taddy sponsored it, the airline. Um, Gigi Perinacci, Perinacci was the uh, mastermind behind it. A lot of pro clubs used to go into it, like the Black Bulls, a few years gone by. So when we got offered to go into that, it was a great experience. Looked after like treated like kings really. Um, had a you know a pretty good squad, so we fancied the chances. And um, we had to. I think the time when we we, we won it, which was um, it's Chieti. Um, I remember we played against Pisa at home, which were a massive club. We're in a massive club now. Um, but Pisa was a big game f for us, and uh, we had to. Um, get a result there, we won one nil, which pretty well cemented our path to the final. And um, that's when we then travelled over to Italy and took part in that final at Chieti, which we came out winners 2-1, which on Reigns and Bobby Sutton scored the goals. And that was a marvellous experience. I mean, that was televised, I think it's 14,000 there for that particular game. But talking to their players afterwards, in my broken Italian, because that'd be Facebook with me, as I always did. The um, they were full time pros. They couldn't understand how we had jobs and were part time. And Italian football then was pretty well paid, so it was quite a comeuppance for them that they got beat by a, a semi pro side that weren't, you know, full time. So that was a that was a fantastic experience, yeah. And uh, we had some good times there. We had a good team spirit. Um, some lively things we could get up to, but within the, you know, rules of travelling abroad, representing the country, and uh, there were some good characters there. Um, I could go into numerous things that we did, but um, one of the things was uh, where Barry was in charge for one of the trips, and um, we had an uh, instant where we were meant to have a curfew at 10 o'clock, all in our rooms, and that's it. So um, we decided then that we'll have a little go, we'll have a little bit of a laugh. And uh, we had um, Keith Walden, one of the senior players, said, right, what we'll do, we'll get some um, sheets, we'll climb all together, unless you've got me in the rooms for 10, we'll throw them out the window, make out all the players have done a bunk. And I'll go down to Barry and the management side and tell them to come up and say, look, I think we've got the problem. So anyway, we got into the room and got the old sheets out the window and uh, Waldo trotted off down to Barry's playing cards, smoked his pipe as he would and uh, Barry went out a word, he said there's uh, something happened upstairs with players, he said oh, what's that Waldo, so you better come up here and have a look, so he's gone into the bedroom and the window's open and there's all the blanket and sheets outside, <laughs> down to the ground floor, it's about two floors up, he said what's this and he said leaning out the window, roughly his old pipe, and they've got me, because I had my own camera, as, as it did, as the only one on tour with a camera, I was held by my legs, leaning out the window, as Barry stuck his head out, I had to take a photograph. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I caught him at it. <laughs> and uh, I didn't get reprimanded, because the rest of the players were in the room as well. But anyway, 
used to get up to some tip tricks, but uh, all in all, that was just a light entertainment to take off the pressure of playing, you know, the broad. And you know, we've never done that before. We were the pro side, but everyone buttoned down, and we went out, and won the tournament. So it was, uh, it was a fantastic experience. Went over on three occasions. Uh, I think got the final each year, um, which was uh, you know amazing, really. Brilliant stuff from from the team. Um, so. A few uh, good questions are coming on the live chat. Firstly, uh, two are coming from Hill Sahi. Uh, the first one is the best play you've ever played with, Mickey. Right, it's, um, I suppose there's about half a dozen people that put you up for this. <laughs> um, I'd say the best player that I've ever played with. Are you talking about some player or any player? Uh, so Hill's just asked uh, best best player. So um, no, was, he didn't make it very clear, did he? He said the best player. So I which go with the best play be player with? Yeah, yes. any 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 well, division, any club. I'd, okay, I'd say that um, I'll, I'll give you three options. Then one in um, non-league level would be Noel Ashford of Enfield uh, fame when he when he played uh, a pro side, uh, Andy Townsend. I think it's my best player, but for some, well, I suppose I've got to give him some credit because he used to put in a few balls for me to score goals. A lot of them had to make into good balls, mind you, to score the goals, but, you know, I did that quite a lot. Um, I suppose that would be Vicky Stevens, but, um, yeah, there's another, I mean, I'd say that to, to say the best player, okay, I stuck my head out and said that, but with the squad that we had, You've got a name quite a few on that, I suppose, but I'd say Mickey because of the goals he made me. That's all. Excellent. Uh, another, uh, the other question from Hill is, uh, who was the hardest opponent you played against? So I suppose we'll we'll go with uh, team and individual player. Um, the team hardest, uh, the hardest team I played against was uh, Enfield when they were prime. They had uh, a fellow called Tony Jennings at the back. And he used to talk his whole way through the game and he would actually tell every player what they were doing, their job. He was a hell of a leader and he used to tell them all the time, stay on your feet, stay on your feet, jump down the line. And he'd talk and he used to wind up the opposition because he used to run the game. Um, Enfield was a solid side then. They were, they were on the top side. I think they were playing Spurs in the Cup um, one, one season then. But that was a, a good side. Um, hardest player, um, I suppose, I must say Paul Edwards of Dulwich. I know Paul quite well, and I didn't know him when I played, apart from the fact that he stand up in the end of his boot. Um, but he was also strong in the air, he's a big lad. He's quite quick, and he used to give me, his job was to stop me playing. And Adam Smith, who was the manager at the time for days, told me this. But I found him really hard because he, he'd mark me tight. He wouldn't let me turn at all. Um, and I used to have a good battle with him. Um, he was a fair player as well. You know, he, he, he didn't take me out too many times, but I thought it was like that at the time. But there was other players that were hard, but they were a bit mercenary, you know. Um, they would they said, we're going to break your leg. And that's what it was. I'd be trying to break your leg. And that, that's how the game was played then. And I just had to be fast to get out the tackles off the time. But, you know, I'd say Paul Edwards, he would be my person to name. And that's the Daddy Chamber player. Uh, Tom Stoker asks, um, did any pro clubs come sniffing Mick? If so, which <laughs> ones? He's, uh, I told him to say that one, I'm sure. Um, yeah, I had Wimbledon, which um, was Dave Bassett. I went to see him. Um, with Alan Gillette and they wanted to sign me um, that was with the I think at the start of the crazy game and, and I, I turned it down actually um, I, I remember going with my dad to speak to Dave Bassett and my dad saying look how many games can you give him and Dave Bassett said no it doesn't work like that he said we're free fancy and we're playing but he said we'll give 100 quid a week and I was working at the time so that is I thought I spoke to a few guys at Sutton as well, the older players, and they said, but you either want to do well here, or if you go to Wim, it's going to be a tough one. You're not going to play in the first team straight away, but perhaps you should give it a bit of time and work your way, and if you're good enough, you'll go. 
And I took that advice. I thought it was good advice. And, and I thought, well, I, we were all struggling a bit then. It was just the start of their, their, you know, their, their progression through the leagues. And um, I turned it down. And um, Barry then announced that I turned it down and I understand it's Saturn. And it was only after, I think when I packed up playing, that I found out that quite a few other clubs were interested, but they'd gone to the club, or Barry, and he said, no, I'm not interested in turning pro, which, okay, I'm, I, I love saying, I don't think I'd ever change anything, but I never got that other opportunities then. And I heard that a few first division clubs at the time were interested. Uh, one of them, which would have been of interest to me, was Chelsea, which was something I didn't realise until um, after I stopped playing. The chief scout spoke to me and said, why did you never come back to us? And I knew they were interested. So, but there we go. That's what life is. And I'm pleased to stay at Sutton. You know, I think that's where I found me level. And... Um, who knows? Um, it may have may have progressed further, but uh, you know, Sutton wasn't the club, and that was it, really. Um, so you scored several important FA Trophy goals and two in the semi-final against uh, Bangor, but you missed the final through an injury picked up in a league game at Slough just three weeks before the final, uh, yeah. which was a devastating blow for yourself and the club as well. Can you uh, talk to me more about that? Yeah, that was. Um... Slough, we played. Yeah, we 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 beat Bangor. We drew up there two all. Um, didn't have a very good game. We didn't travel very well. Um, but it was two all. And um, so I think they we got. I think they got goal that got us back to two, all, which was a bit of a lifeline really. Then we played them at home, and we were up for it. Then we we really, you know, there's no stopping us. And I think Graham Dennis got the first. Um, he's now sadly part. From us, but uh, um, I then got two goals, which I must say that was my most important goals for the club, and that cemented our place in the final. And that was a hell of a night afterwards as well. Um, didn't get home till nine o'clock that night, so it was really late. And um, the uh, a few weeks after, we played Slough in Eric Young of Palace fame as Tom Stoker would know, because it's his team. But um, he went on to play for Palace, but he, he came through me in a bit of a tackle. It wasn't, it was just a typical tackle then, but it damaged my ligaments. And um, I was in really up. I went to hospital the same night and they, they did what they could then and said, you know, don't walk on it. <laughs> and I then had intensive treatment with Danny Keenan for... Um, Week, six weeks before the final to see if I can get it ready. He was great with Annie for what, for what he was, you know, knew about physio and everything, but I'd never worked, so um, I couldn't, I could hardly walk, and I should have had it in plaster because I had it for about a year, that injury. Um, it was quite, quite bad, really, and I still get a twinge occasionally from that damage, which, you know, put me out of the final, but it was, um, yeah, it was a bit of a signal that, but, you know, you go on go forward and it's a shame because we lost it 1-0 and um, I think I was, I was so confident then that I know when we played in the following season uh, Stalford it was and um, we played in the, uh, that was my sort of the, the, the first game back against them after they beat us in that final and uh, I was determined to show what I could do and I scored a hat-trick that game so Got me back, but it's not quite the same, is it really? Not playing at Wembley, but there we go. I went round Wembley before the game, um, or the week before, on crutches to see the um, uh, changing rooms, the pitch, and uh, you know that was uh, so you know it was hard to take, but you know we could have gone with it, yeah. and um, consequently, uh, they played that game. We got that hat trick, so so got something back out of it. Yeah, it would have been great to have you at, at Wembley, certainly, uh, Mickey, that day. Um, Carl Moynihan uh, asks, uh, he wants to know more about uh, Barry Williams. Is there any more interesting stories that you can tell uh, about Barry? <laughs> well, Barry, uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was a 
it was a character, yeah. We had the, you know, the usual stories where it, it quote Shakespeare in the changing room before the game, and the players there, as much as we were educated, Arthur's never heard of Shakespeare. Well, we had heard of Shakespeare, but he then quoted it, and we got, what the hell's that got to do with football? And he came out with this, and we won't, we just didn't know what the time was talking about. So we went and played, and more often than not, we won. Uh, maybe a bit arrogant about that, but that's what we were as a side. We, we had a lot, of, uh, a lot of quality players on that side. And um, Barry knew how to work us, you know. It's, at times, he would, I was very petulant as a player, and um, I was to complain to the referee and to the linesman. And Barry had quite a good relationship with the refereeing society and, and the officials. So he was trying to placate them after I sort of with them with, I never swore at them at all. Um, but throughout the game, I'd just be on their backs. Ref, give me this, give me that. I think, ref, take me out again, how many more times? Ref, how did, and the ref used to come out and eventually go for a choice seat. For ref's sake, can you shut up? Otherwise, I'm going to send you off. So I'd keep quiet then. But this was going on throughout, and, and Barry would work it quite well with the players and that. But uh, yeah, there's a few things we used to do. You know, he was, he, I think he wanted to be a player, really, because he wanted to be one of us. And, you know, we, um, I suppose, a couple of times we stitched him up with his pipe. I put Sunny Lad in it once, and so when he puffed it, he nearly choked to death, which forced me down as he was the old physio. Didn't know what to do, but he patted him on the back and gave him a drink of water. But he didn't know what was in the pipe, I never told him. But uh, we could have made it pretty, uh, pretty ill, really. And then we had, uh, um, are you always leaving stuff around? He'd leave his keys around, you know, and it's, uh, watch you go in the changing room before a game, he'll put his tracksuit on and he'll leave his watch somewhere, all his keys. And um, once or twice a month, moved his car, we were in the car to initially, and he had got a clue where it was. And uh, another time, um, we had his watch and he thought he'd lost it for good. And this was, I think, something like September. And um, it then, as the raffle for the Christmas raffle, we had at the club, and he drew out the prizes, and it was a of hundred people, and on his ticket, one of them was his watch, which we actually <laughs> um, <laughs> contrived to actually make sure that he won. So uh, <laughs> he still don't know this stage. But anyway, little things like that. So it's, uh, it was good. To, uh, we knew where we stood. You know, we had to perform. And, win games, I knew that if I didn't score, he'd be looking to put someone else in, like George Thornton, who was always pushing him for a place, and all the other players were the same. If they weren't performing, he'd look to get another player in. So as much as we had a good, you know, choking a lot, we had to, had to make sure we reached the standards. And um, Barry was good, you know, he was, he, was, uh, he was one of the lads, but at the same time, he was your boss. Uh, so Tim Richards uh, asks, uh, did you ever play with someone who was good enough to play at a higher level but didn't take the step for one reason or another? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good question, I suppose. With, I look at that side we had in the 80s and um, it was a, a marvellous side. And You look at Reigns, Tony Reigns, and you look at Mickey Stevens, you look at Ray Sunnocks, um there was players there that, that could have gone. There was definitely players that could have gone better. They would have gone. They, they, would, have had, they would have been tapped up. And the, the system then was the players would have been approached by your sister, your, your mum, and your dad. They wouldn't go through the club. And they would say that if you're interested, um, just give us a nod, we'll approach the club. And they would have had uh, uh, people approaching them. And I think it's true to the club that. They stayed. Um, okay, they had jobs, um, but at the same time, it's not the same as there is nowadays with agents that be looking for you to move you on, and that's why we stayed at the club so long. But yeah, there was you know, put, I, I mean, I went to the end to most, and Paul McKinnon went to Blackburn Rovers. Um, there was players that, that moved on to other clubs, and they actually came back. I came back. McKinnon came back. Um, so, yeah, there, there was always there was that opportunity if you wanted it. And um, as I say, those players that named there initially uh, were good enough to go elsewhere. Uh, Bobby Green, 
um, he had also a chance at the time for, for Palace and um, for some reason or another he stayed. I mean, there's some great players we think that would have gone to the pro clubs and they stayed at some. Must have been the money we got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, certainly. <laughs> Uh, so Sean uh, Donnelly says, uh, while we've been in lockdown, we've missed you talking through all of your goals. Can you describe number 50 for us? This number 50? Thanks, Sean. <laughs> I thought you'd throw that one in. I can't describe number 50. Um, I don't know if it was equal to But no, I can't remember 50. Um, it's, um, it would have come off the, the part of my body, which most probably wasn't my foot and wasn't my head. So... That's how I can only describe it, the winning goal. That's the main thing. And it most sure didn't hit the net. It mostly just rolled over the line. But it gave it, so it's still a goal. <laughs> um, so Sahil Sahi asks, uh, what do you miss uh, about Saturdays as a player? What do I miss about Saturdays as a player? Um, well, the whole build-up, really. Um, I suppose, um, you know, the preparation for a game. Um you know, we always looked after ourselves. We never, you know, much as you hear the stories, but we never drank before a game because we had to leave the drinks outside the change room, which is fair enough. Um, but, uh, you know, we, you know, the whole thing, match day, um, get to the game, get yourself sorted out, the anticipation, adrenaline starts, going through the team, the build up, um, and, you know, that's, that's what it is. To, to the best of your ability, but ready to go, and that's all part of our lives, and that's what it was for many, many years. And you say that to any player, it's the whole build up to it, and that starts from when you play the game to when you finish it, and then you're ready again, rest day next day, and then you're looking forward to the rest next week. So, yeah, um, I'd say that was that was part of the footballer's life, is this. It's the whole process of the build-up, really. Uh, so, Mr. Jenkor asks, uh, Jenny Corkett asks, uh, would you like to be playing today in the National League against all the ex-league teams? Um, I get asked that quite a bit, but I thought I'd say that um, as much as, yeah, I would love to. Um, but we played against the, the Lincolns, Darlington's, uh, um, going into the Football League then. Scarborough's, uh, um, sides of that that level that were football league clubs, ex football league, they'd come down. Um, so I'd say, okay, there may be a few more now, um, the mighty do fall, but we still played against those good sides then at the time. So it's it's still that national league conference level, um, and certainly the, the, the big thing now, the pitches are better, um, players are fitter. Maybe, uh, but I think that goes down to diet and training, um, and also I think the referees protect you a lot more. So the injuries aren't so common as they used to be. But um, yeah, I'd love to play. I always love to play. But certainly from our time, we we still had the same quality of sides you played against, um, and once you reach that level, you've got to still perform. So there, there's, I can say there are similarities, but at the same time, it has come on like football now. Look at the pitches now. We played on mud, muddy pitches, grounds that were heavy. You never play that now. But now the pitches are lovely. They're flat, yeah. and then the quality, the skill there. If you got the ball to your feet, it's not going to take a bump. Those days in the mud, you didn't know where it was going to get to or not. And if you did, it's right at a bump. You've got to control it still. Plus the fact you've got a player coming in from behind you. So I'd say the players would adjust from those days to these days um, and the diets and their fitness, then skill factor about the same. Um, look at George Best, I was watching that the other night. What a player. I mean, he just bounced off players. The ball's like glued to his foot. So, you know, to say him playing this day and age is like a messy. But would Messi play in the days when he's going to get kicked up in the air, taken at waist height, and play in the mud? Mm. I don't think he'd be the same player. He's putting on weight as well, Messi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Tom Stoker asks, cricket or football? Yeah, cricket in the summer, football in the winter. 
I'd say that um, when I first came to Sutton, I, I had I was playing cricket um, during the summer, and I loved the cricket. Um, you know, uh, and the football sort of interfered with that almost because it's sort of dry pre-season. And I always remember like slipping off for a cricket tour, and at the times when you didn't have mobiles, I had to go to the car box and phone up Ken or whoever was taking the train in, Barry, and say, oh, Barry, Barry, Ken, I've got a cold. Uh, I was trapping. I had a phone that today. And they, I don't know how, but they always come out and say, Joyce, we know you're playing cricket, so why don't you just say, just come to train in Mexico. I said, no, no, it's not going out. All right, all right, all right. Okay. So anyway, the, the cricket was always a, a favourite summer. And... Um, uh, as it happens, then you know, it's community football. So I, I perhaps killed myself because I play football Saturday and Sunday I play cricket. And if there's midweek games, football, I play obviously in training. And then in between, I play cricket on the other days. So I never really left my body really rested, probably. I think that's what contributed to one of the problems with injuries. Um, nowadays, it just wouldn't happen with it. They, they have. You know, the medical team would be saying, no, you can't do that. You either do one or the other. But, uh, yeah, that's my answer. Quick in the summer, football in the winter. Um, this is an interesting one. Uh, Matt Joyce, uh, you might know him, asks, favourite son? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's um, there's half a dozen around, but he hasn't found out yet. The, uh, they're uh, both my favourites, so he's put me on the spot there. So, <laughs> it's the one who works the hardest. So, Robbie, Matt, you got to make sure, yeah? Definitely. Um, Sahil Sai asks, uh, which player in the current Sutton squad most resembles you? In the current... Um, well, I suppose for looks, I suppose Craig Eastman, really, um, <laughs> and the way he plays. Box to box, full of energy, tough, solid, good pass to the ball. Scores a goal. Um, I don't know. That's a good, a very good question. Um, sure, dear. I suppose a front player, um, Omar. I suppose, um, but I used to score goals further out than him. Um, and a lot of people listening wouldn't know that because they weren't born then. So, yeah, I'd say possibly Omar uh, as a front player. Um, my team is a great player. He's great in the air. And um, got great technique, but uh, I'd say that most probably the at the moment. Uh, Mr. Jenkel asks Mickey, have you pl have you kept any football shirts that you played in, and what was your first wage as a first team player for Sutton, apart from the whip round as a sub? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got new shirts that um, uh, finished playing in, but the club don't know that yet because they wouldn't give us any shirts. Now, I've still got a shirt which um, I think it's actually the uh, in that season when we played Middlesbrough which was, and the FA Cup runs to Middlesbrough and um, following you with Coventry. It's those shirts which uh, I've got one of those which um, I've kept. And also, uh, well, I was in the squad side of the semi pro side which was many years ago and they switched shirts then when we played Italy and uh, Scotland and Holland. So that's shirts which I've kept, but that's about all really. First wage, um, God dear, that's, that's, that runs into mega, I mean, it must be oh, 350 pence, I suppose, which is about 35 quid. I think that was about the first, first uh, wage packet I had, and that was a week, and then there would be uh, parents' money, which went up, I think it was something like a fiver. And so if you play two games, that's another 10, that's 45. And then guess how much win bonus I had? Uh, oof. I, I, I'll, let you, I'll let you take the floor with that one. <laughs> well, there was no win bonus then, because I didn't have it, but there was a goal bonus. And my goal bonus was £2. So that was it. So that's from the heady heights of earning possibly expenses of about a five for travelling when I was playing reserves to sign a contract. So that was back in 77, 78, around about that sort of time. So, um, as I said, we, we 
I think Barry then, um, I can't remember that, but Barry took over the negotiating and uh, we had an incident where Tony Raines, Mickey Stevens, myself said, right, when you go in for a great figure, right, we're going to go hard, we're going to try and negotiate a good deal, right? And what we do, when you come out, whoever goes in first, come out and tell you what you've done, we'll negotiate the same. So we'll keep the same because he wants to keep us, doesn't he? So we all went, yeah, we'll do that. We're solid. We're going to go and get and negotiate a good deal. So Barry's in his room. So Ronzi comes in first. Chat, chat, Corvin out, comes out. It's a bit sort of, okay, you mean, yeah, okay. Just go and see what you can get. Then come back and tell me, okay. So Abel's gone in, chatted, come back, said, yeah, he said, um, yeah, you're going, Joyce, see what you get. So I've gone in and Barry said, look, this is what we're going. He said, you won the same amount, 35 blah, 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 five pounds. He said, um, I'm going to give you another two quid a week. I went, what? He said, no, no, I'm going to give you another two quid a week. He said, he deserved it. He's going to do well this year. Told the others as well. I said, okay, well, two quid a week. I said, look, Barry, that's embarrassing. I said, look, don't, don't worry about two quid. I'm happy to play as we are. I mean, if the others are staying, I'll play. I said, we love the club, you know, we want to do well. So Barry sat to his pipe, went, okay, Josh, yeah, that's what you feel. Yeah, thanks very much for going. So I went to the others. I said, look, how would you get on? What's the negotiate? Because we can all go back. He said, but I've, I've just said, no, forget it. And they said, well, that's what I said. And Mainz, he said the same. I went, why well, isn't all this hard negotiating? He said, no, it's just Barry. That's what he does, isn't it? He's, he's got us into a situation where we feel guilty about taking the money from the club. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up, ended up with the same money the next season thinking we're going to get another 20 quid each or 25 quid and we didn't we just got the same money but we just wanted to play with the club and that's what we were we were a band of brothers there because i think summit and a few others went in as well and they come out the same they said no couldn't take the two quid <laughs> <laughs> but that's what it was and yet car shorten and sides local sides which um to us at the time i think the same league uh, Clarky who had gone there at the same time, gained 70 quid a week, twice as much. But, and we went into that. We had jobs and we just wanted to do well. And that's, that's a tribute to them as well, because we did. We had a successful 10 years then. Uh, so, Matt Joyce uh, has put another two questions in. Uh, Favourite teammate, uh, and was Mickey Stevens any good? He talks a good game. Our team, we had a great, our teammates were everyone. I mean, you even have, you know, John Raines, uh, Dave Collier, um, they, they were our mentors. Keith Walden, you know, they were the experienced players and they knew that if they kept us on board, they'd win things. And Rich, Mickey, Tony, Ray Sunnox, players of that ability, they knew that if they kept just okay, then they'll do well. So for me to have a, a favourite would have been at the time we, all, we we knew where we stood as a as a side and um, we all as I said we were a band of brothers so yeah Mickey Stevens he always talks a good game but as I said a lot of these balls I used to make good because he used to over here and buy again back bring them in then score and he'd always used to claim the assist which is fair enough <laughs> but I used to tell me one day I pass the ball to you and you can score <laughs> but you know Mainzy. What a great player there. Read the game well, solid. That's Tony. And he got his brother there, John Raines. And you wouldn't want to meet him in the dark alley, which, well, we <clears throat> wouldn't want to meet him anyway. But he was solid again. He'd been everything. He had come off cut, bruised. But he used to be afterwards, we'd go out together. And that was it. We, we had a side that we went out together, we fought together, we played together. And we've known, for, you know, lost John now. Ryan Dennis, you know, you've got Bobby Green, Steve Rogers, players like that. We still we still get them, we still see each other. And that's that's fantastic, really, after all these years. I mean, they look a lot older than me now, obviously. But, you know, we still see them. And um, it's great that they can, you know, still be part of that side. And um, we will never lose that as such. So to have an individual player, yeah. And when you get older, you still keep that. You know, respect to each other and that friendship and, and, and that's quite good in the way uh, so Sean Donnelly uh, says uh, me again Joycey 
all joking apart, since you retired as a player, what is your favourite game as a fan and an ambassador for the U's? Hashtag legend. <laughs> what is my favourite? What was that? My favourite game. Uh, so yeah, what's your uh, what's your favourite game as a fan and an ambassador f- uh, for the U? So yeah, since you since you retired, I'm guessing. Um, I think uh, favourite game. God oh, dear. Um, I suppose um, since I've finished playing, watching. I mean, okay, the Arsenal game was fantastic, wasn't it? I mean, who could deny that? That was all a different world then, weren't we? And, and that sort of made me up when Dave Fairbrother asked me to become a director. I thought, oh, there's commitments. I need to, if I do anything, I want to do it well. I want to just do it as a, you know, in name only. And, you know, the club then um, was starting to do things and Dos had a good squad. And, and then we got to that cup run and reached the Arsenal. And uh, bear in mind, we played Leeds as well. AFC Wimbledon, oh dear, what, would I say the AFC Wimbledon? I think AFC Wimbledon game of that cup run, I was in it with the crowd and that, and that was brilliant. Um, there was, there was, you know, all sorts in there. There was, uh, say, Tom Stoker, his dad, I mean, he, he aged during that game and then he came down to the youth level at the end because it was such a fascinating game and to win 3-1. And, I suppose it gets better as you go along and say to get to the Arsenal, I suppose the Wimbledon game, I suppose the Wimbledon game would be the one I'd say, and that just cemented the rest of the games afterwards. And as an ambassador, um, well, that for me then made, you know, this club looked like then for me, that's now we're playing in these fantastic grounds that we're travelling to, um, which... Um, you know, you find at Wrexham's and, and Chesterfield's and Stockport's, you know, fantastic. It's bad for them because they're coming down, but it's great for us as a club. And I'm hoping that um, you know, I can promote this club that I've, I've loved. And we've got this former players association, which we've now got quite a number of names, um, which we're always looking for more names as they come about from old and new. And that's what it's about, and and it's it's good. We're tied up with other clubs as well: Dulwich, Wickham, um, Staines, uh, and you know, it's tides that uh, that um, have played when we've played, and they've got their ex players that have played for them for many years. And um, I think that's good. We've got to promote it. We've got to keep ourselves going. We need them as much as they need us. Um, and maybe one day we could just get that little promotion, and you never know into the football league and we've got a great board of directors that can push us in that direction um, but obviously it comes with a can be a cost which uh, is the big thing to consider we don't want to sacrifice everything just to go out and then find the club just disappears because it's gone too far so yeah just promote the club in the best way as an ambassador really yeah, that certainly be the dream going up to the Football League. Um, Alex Marsh asks, uh, why is Robbie much better at football than Matthew? <laughs> <laughs> right, Alex and Matthew and Robbie were in my team as a youngster. And I, I tell you what, one of the biggest things was when I, um, I, met, I coached them from my boys and, and Alex. Uh, he was captain of the side from the age of about eight years of age. So I kept for about eight years there under 16. And funny enough, we had to play um, um, a last game of the season to win the league. Bear in mind, we're at Old Counties, which is a local side, and um, we were playing against the Corinthian Casuals and a side called Leatherhead, would you believe, <laughs> run by a David Harlow, um, exciting player. And um, we had to win the last game. And Alex was, was the... Uh, captain's side goalkeeper and can we did catch a couple occasionally but um Matthew played in the game and Robbie was sub he's a bit younger Robbie and uh, a bit like me quiet and you know he's uh, sort of a bit shy at times but you know and we had to win that game we won nil down and um it was getting you know to the last sort of quarter of an hour so 20 minutes 
one of the women, you know, on goes Robbie. And five minutes later, he scores the equaliser. Fantastic, one all. Now we've got to win the game. We beat the points. Leatherhead are going to win us, beats us if not. And I think five minutes to go, we got the winner. And I was so made up, it was so good that these boys had stayed with us for eight years. They, you know, they, they stuck together. And I think the strength of the team just shows that. And we were getting players approached by these football clubs, Fulham's and Palaces and Chelsea. You know, take these youngsters away, take them away for, you know, they promised the, the, you know, how great they're going to be at the age of 15, 14 years of age. Uh, it's all wrong, I think. But no, they stayed with us and we won that league. And so, Robbie, he scored that goal and he was, he was greatest player then, but Matt played the whole game and he saw it as a rock that game. So, I can't say one was better than the other. Otherwise, they'll kill me. <laughs> Um, Alex Marsh also asks, uh, what is the best goal you have seen at Gander Green Lane? Oh, he's such a tight. I tell you what, he's such a tight. He's a school teacher now, as you believe it, Sutton Grammar. <laughs> and he's only trying to do that because he played in a game of Vets game. How is he playing the Vets game when he's younger than, I mean, he's 25. And he just happened to miss it one that has gone in under the bar from 25 yards. And he just wants me to mention that, but... Um, no, that was that was a good goal, Alex. But um, as you miss hit it, I can't say it was the best goal. But I spe- the best goal I think I've seen um, for a Sun player um, was Norman Milne, um, who was a blast in the past. And poor old Norman's departed now from us. And um, I was watching that from the stand. I, I was I think I was injured again, but I was only just started playing. And uh, Norm was a bit of a nigger. He was such a, he looked like a bandit, big moustache. And um, he, had, he really lined up. I mean, the crowd loved him because he, he's, he needed, something needed lift and he was a player that was going to, you know, if, if anything, lift the, the, the side. And um, we were playing this, I can't remember what it was, a cup game. And Norm used to go on these dribbles and lose the ball. We got the ball from the halfway line. And he beat three or four players, and this was fantastic. He carried on. The crowd were getting more and more into it. He beat another player, beat another player. At the edge of the box, and thought, oh, Norman, don't lose it now. Don't smash the bar. Smashed this ball, went past the keeper. What a goal. And it, and it just sort of raised them. Do you know what? The club for that season, it, and it made me as well, and people watching just think, God, that's fantastic. That's what people want to see. That's what you want to entertain. And score goals and he just took it apart and that was I think for me to, to see that I remember that goal I've always remembered it I just saw his wonder player and then in that playing the same side we did old Norman he never did it again but um, <laughs> that goal for me was the best and that must have been well 40 odd years ago I suppose but there we go Right, I have a, a few questions in uh, from anonymous from Cheen. So uh, actually, in in the comment, yeah, in the comment section, actually, guys, guess who anonymous from Cheen is? I won't give anything away though. Uh, so, firstly, uh, can you clarify uh, that Mickey Stevens did get eight assists in that game against Leatherhead? Because the match report said so. <laughs> So he's had to throw that one in on me, really. The, um, yeah, actually, yeah, well, as I said, he, um, I made a lot of his balls good from, you know, what he did. But, um, yeah, I think he did. I can't totally remember, but I'm sure that if he says it was eight, I'll go for eight, eight if that's what we're saying. But um, everything went right that day. I mean, five goals at half time, And um, I remember the rest of the side. I mean, Larry at half time said to me, um, he was playing at the time, Larry Pritchard, and uh, he, he looked at me and he said, Joyce, you don't think you've done enough now. He said, you think you're the best player. He said, if you're the best player, you're going to go and score more goals. He said, five's good, but he said, no one's going to think more of that. Just, you go and, do it, go and get 10. And you see it, you know, and it's, that's what it was at all. Was, we'd won the game, but the players then were fantastic because... What they did was they helped me score those goals, those remaining goals. 
the trouble was though, they weren't that good really because they could have maybe scored 10. <laughs> and the four extra I got was a nine. So they just made the goals for me. You know, they, whatever they did, they could pass to me in a good position and it just went in. And I don't know, it, one of those things that uh, can never be repeated, but a record's there to be broken, I suppose. True or false? Um, oh, sorry. Um, this one's going to be a, a bit of an interesting one for you. Um, true or false? Did you see the Woody Allen film "Everything You Wanted to Know About Sex"? Ten nights on the trot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's only because Abel had the video. I mean, let me borrow it. <laughs> uh, we used to go out and have a drink during the week and say Friday. As I said. Joking apart, we used to like do we say, used to have a drink and do this, but we never actually had a drink before on Friday night. Um, we go out and we go to the cinema. Uh, there's something to do, and that's what it was. And we'd end up going to see some city film, and that's, that ended up something like that. And we'd watch a Woody Allen film for the sake of it, and it's just something to do, really. Um, you know, but we never went out and and sort of got ourselves or anything like that we looked after ourselves and you know we couldn't afford to to, to take that chance and i think at times that the like the manager or certain people would be making phone calls to houses everyone's in and that did actually happen and had a few times with me but yeah anyway people had the video we let me borrow it only twice <laughs> Can you elaborate more on these wonder tablets that were supposed to be t uh, were to be taken as suppositories? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's anonymous from Cheen, so everyone guess in the comments, and I'm, I'll ask you after all the questions. Uh, Mick, you think it is? This, this anonymous is from Cheen again, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we had a, that was when we um, I think turn player and an injury, and that's when Danny Keenan had these tablets, which were placebos. But what happened, he used to go into um, the physio with an able, and soft and able, because he had more injuries than me. And um, Danny said to him, said, son, you know, got an injury, see it, take that, take that. He said, just make sure, you know, take that. And Danny would go out of the room and to go and get something or whatever. And Abel was there, seeing him on the knees on the old bench, trying to stick his tablets up his backside. <laughs> and Danny's come back and said, no, 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 you don't do that. He said, you don't drink him with this water. I've only got to get you some water. <laughs> so... Um, so that often was the case. Abel was a bit naive when it comes to taking tablets. And lastly, uh, anonymous from, uh, from Cheam donates a prize of one hour's tennis on centre court at Wimbledon. So, what do you make of that? <laughs> <laughs> there won't be any tennis this year. Just been waiting a long, long time for that. No, that was um, yeah, that was a good scam. That one actually. This we had to, uh, uh, yeah. Benny Stevens was a bit of a tennis player, so um, we had a whole crying for that, but um, it never came about. But uh, he's, he's still pandering for that that game at ten, tennis at Wimbledon. One day will happen, Abe, so <laughs> don't worry. It, will be, it won't be this year, though, unfortunately. No, of course not. Um, yeah, so everyone, get your comments on the live chat who you think Anonymous from Cheam is. Uh, Mickey, have you got a guess uh, as to who it is? I'm sure it is Abel, because he's Cheam. But he says that's Cheam's the posh end. North Cheam, most probably is where he's from. So I'd say that he's most probably getting them mixed up with the posh bit. But he's most probably Abel, Mickey Stevens. Well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll leave it on that. Um, anyway, uh, the next question uh, from Tom Stoker. Would you rather share a room with Dougie Randall or Chris Vag? <laughs> I suppose um, I suppose I have to say Faggy because he's got safer hands. Being the next goalkeeper. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good reason to. It's fair. <laughs> yeah, you can make what you want of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, James King asks, uh, "What was Bruce like back in those days?" Bruce, blimey, right? Yeah, well, Bruce and me go back. We go back. I mean, I think Bruce has been there. Um, same same as me about the time maybe longer I'm not sure but uh, yeah I've, I've got Bruce I've a great time um, 
he's he's been a great asset for the club, fantastic. And um, well, we'll be without him. Don't tell him this. I suspect he's listening anyway. But <laughs> um, yeah, we go back a long way, and uh, I used to call Bruce Hare Flick because he used to have a big uh, one of these. You know, uh, hello, hello. I don't know if you'd ever watched that, Tom. But he used to have one of these big leather coats, and he used to walk around like Hare Flick. Which um, now he's got a proper manager's coat, so he looks the part now. But um, yeah, he was he was I suppose chairman in waiting really when Dan Hearn, who was fantastic chairman, um, and um, Peter Malloy, he was there, and of course Bruce was, was sort of learning the trade from them really, and they run the club as they have done as Bruce has carried it on today. Um, it's great to see now that you know. All those years ago, Shan, you know, has been back at the club, although she never left, but, you know, Dave's daughter and that, and, and she's actively involved there, and, and you've got people like Brian Williams as well, but um, it's good that Bruce is, is in charge, and uh, he's uh, a great ambassador for the club as such, in that respect. Uh, Mr. Jenko, oh, oh sorry. Um, Mr. Jenko asks, uh, did you ever try your hand as a manager and would you like to be one? Um, I was, when I picked up playing, um, I finished playing when I was 29 and um, I went into um, Dave Codier and said, right, you're going to do your badge, full badge, he said, to coaching, because I used to do quite a bit of coaching then, I used to love that, but with my hip, Gone, I was limping. I looked the right. Well, it wasn't a good effort to limp around trying to coach football when I could hardly walk on it. So, um, I then went into um, running the Capital League side, which the club you have. And we had um, some um, very good games actually where we played the pro sides like the West Ham's, Colchester's, and Gillingham's, Cambridge, and Orient's, sides like that. We played at their stadium, so that was my job to run the Capital League side. Ken I and run the Suburban League side. And we played, actually, one of the games we played, we had a very famous player that started his career back in 95. We played for West Ham. Who do you think it is, Tom? Any idea? Um, oh. West Ham? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Ex manager's son? Um. I'm a Chelsea legend. Chelsea legend. Oh, Matt. I, I, well, you I'm beat you. Chelsea. I can't give it any more than that. Oh, Frank Lampard. Yeah, <laughs> Frank Lampard, of That's course. Tell you, mate. I got, yeah, he had to spoon for me that one in the end. I, sh I should have really done better on that one, never mind. You should have done. I gave away too much there, but yeah. Lampard played, which was fantastic, really, because at the time, uh, I don't know, it must have been 17, 16, playing in the side then, and um, his father. I think it was with West Ham at the time. So I've actually got the programme from that game, um, Sutton played it. And it's great to see, you know, his involvement from that early age up. But the, the Capital League side was the side that I ran anyway. And uh, uh, I just thoroughly enjoyed that. It was fantastic. Um, we played Wickham, Wickham and it with Martin O'Neill was the manager. Uh, so they, you know, they were the games that. Um, sort of pacified my need for football that I couldn't play anymore. Uh, so question that's come in, uh, did you ever get in the way of a Macca shot? As a fan, the ball coming our way was a scary thing. Yeah, uh, Paul it was uh, a super, super player. I mean, he, he, um, he was left back when I first Oh, first man, Sutton, I think he was, or he played midfield, and then they put him left back, Blunt put him left back. And he did well there, he won since he's left, but he, he, he did well and then he pushed him up front and um, he had a massive shot in him. He was, you know, it was like a can. Those balls then weren't as they are now, they didn't move from the air. Um, if you got hit by them, you had to, well, they gave you the last guide sometimes because you never know where you're going to survive it. But um, I think I've got in way of a couple, I've got deflections and I claimed it most probably. But I never got in front of the cat. If he was going to shoot, I got out of the way sharpish. And, you know, God forbid any flag getting in the way of his shots. But, yeah, he had a fantastic shot. And made him the top goal scorer for the club, which was fantastic. So, uh, but then again, took, I think, out of his 
um, 279 goals. I think 260 were penalties. But um, I'm not, I don't feel hard about it, but there we go. <laughs> uh, Sean Donnelly asks, uh, Joycey, will you come on an away day with the COCs? Uh, we have a defibrillator if needed. Also, <laughs> what do you think of the away support? Um, the away support is, my, I'll tell you what, I've, I'm, I, I think it's, it's made me because going away to the games now um, is, is a good experience. But when you go to somewhere like Halifax or Stockport or Torquay was one of the best games. Um, and to see a hundred of supporters there out singing the 2000 or whatever they were tall key um was what a day um it's actually brilliant and i think the the commitment of of these these supporters that go they make a day of it so they're not just there to go out they go and have a weekend which is brilliant um but you can't be and do you know what it's almost it's like comforting that if you're with the directors and you can actually hear some supporters singing, it's not the whole world against you. You think there's a part of, and that's where the players respect it big time. It knows the players always go over to the to the supporters and show their appreciation. They're, they're fantastic. I think the side at the moment is so respectful. They go ambition about them, and um, they they appreciate that support big time. But the Cox are oh, yeah, they're good lads. They're, they're a great bunch. They know their football, um, and um, they're great supporters for the club. And uh, it's a, it's great when they're down there. Um, they, they make the, they make the club as it is. And as I say, when you're going away, they're there as well. It makes it even better. Uh, can you just tell me about what the squad thought when uh, Keith Blunt uh, left for Malmo? Who, of course, uh, lost uh, one 0 to Brian Clough's Nottingham Forest in the European Cup final. Um, Keith Brandt was uh, um, a fantastic manager for, for Sun. He, he brought that discipline in and, you know, there was, there's, I mean, I found this, um, I reacted to, um, and he was the manager there, but he, he wouldn't suffer faults like he, he suffered me for some reason, but um, he knew that if he, if he let me go and do what I did, I would, I would lose, I'd, I'd would be where I was, and he often got to the point where he said, "That's it, you're out of this club. You're not going." And next game, I'd do twice as well. And he knew how to play me. He, he, he threatened me to what he had to do to get the best out of me. Some players would kill, and they'd go. They couldn't handle it, but he had that ability. And then when he left, he left it in good hands because he passed out to Barry. Um, and Barry was a different person altogether, but. That kept the respect that I had with Cleef, and that uh, Barry taken over. So that was passed on. I knew where I stood. Um, but he he went with Bob Houghton to Malmo, and um, that was for, for, you know it shows the quality of the man because he he had a coaching a coaching ability. His, his passing game, um, he, you know, he knew it. the players were highly coached as that. We were very privileged. We had. Um, uh, Full badge coaches come down. Uh, Barry had them bring been brought in. Blunty brought them in, and they had a lot of knowledge about the game. We had to know our game, you know. And the club lost a great person there, and I don't think it was. I think he was, you know, underrated in some way. But I think we did really like what he did do for us. But when he went to now, no, that was such an achievement. Um, of course, he came back to Sutton, uh, which wasn't such a good time because things didn't go the right way. Um, but that was that was marvellous, you know, coming from Sutton, go to Malmo, go to Benfica and the European Cup final, blinded. Um, so Mark Frake actually just said, by the way, your 50th goal was at uh, Walthamstow Avenue in November 1980. So there you go. Who, who said that? Uh, Mark Frake. Frakes, yeah. yeah. Well, he's Mr. Statistics fan, isn't he? He's, he's fantastic. Yep. I mean, that makes the cup like what it is. You know, you can throw that at him and he'll come back with an answer. But don't tell him that. <laughs> Yeah, Freak, he's certainly got a wealth of knowledge. Um, I'm actually just going to go on to your partnership with, with Paul McKinnon, in particularly the 1984-85 season where we won the Ismian League. 
Uh, yeah, take us back to that time and what partnership you guys had uh, that in particular season, uh, scoring 55 yeah. league goals between you. Yeah, it was, it was more of a six. It was from Portals on, um, I mean, we, we both were selling our strikers, really. And the side that we had in, in them was, you know, players like Keith Walden and Steve Rogers and the Rangers and Mick Stevens and Sonnets and Dave Connery goal and, and, you know, we had some, some fantastic players there. And they knew our strengths. We were both quick. Paul was quick. Um, we didn't hold the ball that at all. Um, they, they needed the ball to our feet. And we could turn players and we could run up players, we fight players. And I think from the point of view of defending us, I remember talking to players and they said, we don't know which one to mark because if we mark you, then Paul McKinnon scores, you mark him, we put two bads against defend. And that was great because that, if two won Paul, then I'll catch McKinnon score. So we were just free scoring. We, you know, we had that. Ability. We had some great service from the Saints, the Sonics, and Stevens, and you know the, the strength at the back of the. the so, so we were a formidable side, and um, the, the season when you know to win the league, it was it became easy almost, which is crazy to say, but it did. We we, we knew we'd score every game, and it's just a matter of how many. I just scored 51 year, 50 something, and I scored 50 odd something the other year. Uh, they counted his friendlies, but they didn't count mine for some reason. But I must have a word about that. Fakers will be after me on that. <laughs> but uh, we had a great partnership, so it was, um, you know, it went up and up from there. It was, it was brilliant. And we've always worked with fun players as well, later on, Lenny Dennis, and, you know, from the days of Ricky Kidd when he played. And it, it just was part of the same way. And that continued, really. Um, so you left for Maidstone uh, that summer after that promotion uh, due to the club's decision not to take promotion. Um, so can you give the viewers a bit more insight uh, with your experience at Maidstone? Yeah, well, it, it was... Um, I went to Maidstone because of Barry Fry who tapped me up for quite a few weeks and, and he kept finding... And um, I told the club that, and I said, Look, and they said, Well, no, we won't let you go, we won't let you go. And Barry Fry kept phoning, he said, Look, we'll give you, a, we'll give you 75 quid a week. He said, I said, Barry, look, I'm not going to go. He said, Find out, we give you 100 quid a week. And I said, Look, no, it's not the money. He said, um, I'll give you only 25 quid a week. I went, Okay, I'll go then. So, um, no, anyway, um, I said, No, it's not that. I said, Look, I want to go, but I'm just sort of uneasy about it. And it did really, with the fact that it was me, they wanted me. Um, and I just thought then that I wanted to be there to go to the club. I tried to go to the club. I think I can understand why they didn't go, but I just thought I had to go and stretch myself. I needed to push myself. And I went to Maystone and... Um, they were a well-paid club, a well, well sort of funded. They, they had a professional outlet. You had to wear your jacket and tie, you know, Sutton, um, built it on the same premise as the Sun. And it was amazing because when I went there, Barry Fry was, was mad as that, but he was a lovely fella, but he just, as he said, look, I bought you to score goals. He said, I don't need to coach you. And we used to go and coach ourselves almost. And then after about 10 games, we were struggling a bit. And the next week, there'd be not 15 in the changing room, there'd be 17. So there'd be two new players he's got. But the following week, there'd be 20 in the changing room. I'm thinking, God, what's going on here? And there'd be somebody else on the side, and there'd be two or three more different players coming in. The following week, there'd be about 25 in the changing room. And he was just going out, and they had unlimited funds getting players. And eventually got to the point where we, we struggled um, because there was no real cohesion with the team. Uh, it wasn't like a Sutton set up. The players were coming and going. Uh, it was very massive. It got to the point where at the end of the season, we were struggling. We were going to go down. And he had, he got St. Barry, unfortunately. John Ryan took over. And um, I experienced then a different sort of set up facing relegation the season. And 
we had to win I think three of the last four or five games and they just put they threw money at it they just said there's going to be a thousand pounds which was a lot of money then shared between the 11 players if you win this game and we're going to bring in a front player to play with you Joyce up front and we're going to pay him whatever they did and what happened we won those three games I think I got about six goals in those three games because they did actually had someone who could actually coach your side to what our abilities were we stayed up um, and then Bill Williams came the year after and um, so my sort of jumping to Maystone at the time was good um, I enjoyed it but it was it was that end of the season got a bit nitty gritty and it wasn't from the fact that we weren't good it just we weren't coached and Barry was just mad he had two heart attacks during the season one on the train coming home from the game he had to stop his train off he went to hospital in another time and he was he was he was a lovely fella I like Barry but he was just a bit of a maverick and uh, he did it like at Barnet and other clubs he was with he just throw money at it but was his house uh, to pay players he's mad and um you know, that, that's how it was. And then the following season, Bill Williams came, scored a hat-trick against Altrincham. And then the week after, I think, he wanted, um, I think Ben told me, basically, I went to Sutton then. Uh, came back to Sutton, he tried to get me off to other clubs and uh, he needed to go and get another front player in and I went back to Sutton. So that was my brief um, experience 18 months at Maidstone. Uh, Julian Rosario has uh, asked two questions. Uh, Mickey, have you ever not walked out, uh, walked when, when out? Oh, I'll say it again, sorry, I've got my words mixed up there. Mickey, have you ever not walked when out at cricket? And also, do you think John Raines could have made it as a striker? Um, I couldn't possibly answer that question about cricket. And um, John Raines, uh, he wouldn't make it as a striker because... Um, I say that in the way that he played the striker as a um, a fantastic striker in a way because he scored goals. He got, I think I got a hat trick one week and then I couldn't play. And then he played up front and scored a hat trick as well. But he was about, he was solid at the back and he, 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 like anybody going up front, you can do well for a few games and he did that for a few games. And then afterwards, he gets sussed out, you know. Um, defenders know what your strengths and weaknesses are. And Rainsy just was intimidating. He was good in the air, strong in the air. And for what he did, he was thrilling. That's what he was for the club. But at the end of the day, his great strength was at the back and leader of the side. And as I said, I remember him coming off games. He played against Dave. I think it was uh, David Wade. There was another fellow at Barking, Peter Burton. Tall, ugly fella, six foot four. And they battered each other. Rainsy came off with stitches. Bird came off with stitches. And, you know, that just showed you what the game was like. And it was blood splattered. But they went for it healthily. But he was a fantastic back player. But as a front player, he didn't do bad. He scored two goals and I got those nine. Which he should have passed to me, really. But I forgive him. Uh, Mr. Jenkel asks, uh, were you in the crowd when Sutton played Leeds in 1970 when we lost 6-0? And if so, where did you stand or sit? Um, I wasn't in the crowd then. Uh, actually, no. I um, can't remember. That was, uh, I was 12 then, I think. Um, but um, I remember the game. And, um, but no, I wasn't at that game, unfortunately. But... Uh, yeah, so it drew my attention to Sam. That was the old... And unfortunately, I think Norman Hunter, who died today, uh, played in that game. And um, it's very sad. And uh, the chat out on his premiers. Giles, Anne Clark, Roma, uh, Mick Jones, Gary Spray, fantastic side, Paul Rooney. I named them all. Billy Bremner, yeah. Fantastic side. Don Revy, the manager. Yeah, certainly Leeds had some superb players uh, back in that day. Um, Alex, Mar Alex Marsh says, um, Mick Stevens has asked me to ask this. Who's doing the questions, Mickey Joyce or myself? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the quiz questions later, Tom. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, uh, Tom Stoker asks, uh, what's the best stitch up you've ever had? Uh, I'll say it again, sorry. What's the best stitch up you ever did of a fellow player? Apart from the Wimbledon one where Mickey Stephen had, um, well, I, I don't know really. There's been a few, I suppose, in the time. I've, um, I've stitched up someone's cricket trousers once um, when they had them in the bag and then hit his bag. So when he got out to play, he had to put his cricket trousers on. It looked like a lost schoolboy. But um, I don't know, I can't remember the bloke's name. Um, there used to be the, I mean, I was in the bit of practical chamber, but I always sort of, I did it as a team thing, really. Um, I suppose the, the deep heat and the pants, at heart, you know, before the end of the game, that always went down well afterwards. Um, mind you, um, of course, a bit of embarrassment uh, sometimes when people had to go back with rashes. Um, but, um, yeah, there was a few a few things like that that went on over the, over the past, you know. Um, but uh, it, it was always done in... in, in there's a sort of banter, really, and there's so many things in the past that we've done that uh, uh, you could say that um, you had to understand who the people were you're doing them to because they, they had a good sense of humour as well. So, but uh, there was a couple of things there, so for starters, anyway. Uh, Stuart Sharkey says, Thank you, Mickey, uh, for your story, the history of the club. It was great to hear about the history of Sutton United. It's a great message there from Stuart. Uh, oh, the interesting one from uh, Frakey. Joycey and Rainsey both scored two successive hat tricks in a four match run during the 82 uh, 83 season. He, he didn't initially say 83 84, but uh, Frakey's uh, readjusted that and said, yeah, it was, a, it was actually 82 83 season. That's right. Yeah, I remember that. Um, yeah, I think I scored the two on the try. Then Rainsey, um, I had a. Um, I can't remember now, I was injured. I think I had possibly the worst head cold you'd ever known. Uh, but I used to carry on to the best of ability. But anyway, I couldn't play the next game. And then Wayne's had to get up front. And uh, he ended up scoring. Um, yeah, I think he did. I can't remember the team who played. Hendon might have been one of them. Fakers would know. But um, yeah, that just showed the ability in the side, you know. And as for a manager, it needs to be the blessing, really, because with the side that Gary had um, those days that you know he could he could put a player in that position and end up scoring that how does that work? It's it's fantastic as a as a side. And as I said that that showed us that ten years that we were at the, the top, um, those players could have gone elsewhere. Um, JR, I think he most surely could have gone elsewhere. But um oh wanna play something and that's what it was. Uh, Mr. Jenkel says, brilliant interview, guys. Uh, could listen to you all night. Mind you, uh, you've been going for an hour and a half, so we might be. <laughs> uh, seriously, great listen. Thanks for that comment, Mr. Jenkel. Yeah, certainly been going for a while. Surprising people are still away. Yeah, exactly. Um, so your final tally for Sutton was 405 games, 209 goals, which, which shows your ability as an actual goal scorer th you know, throughout your career. That That isn't a bad tally, is it? <laughs> No, I'm very proud of it actually, and um, no, it's, it's, it's good. I enjoyed what I did, and, and that's from my ability. I knew when people were played that if I wanted to score, I'd be out, and I was in certain terms about that. That it, it's now the game's changed so much, hasn't it? That you can be a, a fun player and not score for about 10 games or nine months, even you still hold yourself in your sight. But in those days, we you, you lived by what you did. And I was a goal scorer, and if I didn't score, then I wouldn't expect him to play. Um, I suppose goalkeepers are the same. It's, it's, it's a lot of thin margins, really. But um, no, I enjoyed it. And um, I never took penalties, mind you. Um, but um, I, I think there's you know, certain players for those positions, and Paul McKinnon was a great penalty taker. Um, and players have that coolness in front from you know standing position. But uh, mine, I, I just had an instinct in the area, really, and uh, I just learned that from knowing where the goal was and my accuracy, which was <laughs> most of the time you need that. But sniffing out a goal, Alan Clark, I'd say, you know, the Leeds player, used to call him Sniffer. I don't know whether he had a lot of colds or not, but <laughs> he used to score goals from 
tap-ins and he always used to be in the right place at the right time and it's it's knowing your game um and the big thing was which from without boring too much was that i felt was fantastic thing when we when they got Lenny dennis who uh, came to the club and um paul was playing out front at the same time they pushed me to left midfield and that's when we had the cup runs which i thought fantastic really because I can actually play in another position. Well, I was a midfield player when I was very young anyway. But to put me in that position, um, I got away with it. And he was quite good in a way that I was respected enough to play in that position. We played Middlesbrough, whole thing. But then I had the problem with the hit, which, you know, then pushed me off, off the game after that. And the following year, they played the commentary side. And, uh, it's, you know, it just tells you what happened there. So, you know, from my years of fun play, I, was, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, as I say, it's, uh, I wouldn't change it for life for me. Oh, yeah, so actually, Tony Dolbear just texted me saying your hat tricks were against Hitching, Hitching and Kinsing, uh, Kingstonian, and Rainsies were against Windsor and Carl Shorten. So, there you go. Yeah, that... Windsor and Carl Shorten were, were poor sides, really. <laughs> Hitching and Kingstonian were their fantastic sides, yeah. It's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, they, they were, that was remarkable, really, yeah, as I say, for him to go and play in the sides and then score. But that's great for statistics, people. I've got a, um, I've got a thing here with um, a, a quiz for the viewers, Pat, well, not a quiz, but this may be, um, can, when I used to play, we used to run out to um, United We Stand, and Curly will remember this. I'm sure he played then and people of that era. And perhaps the modern day supporter may or may not know, but we used to run out to about who was the actual um, group that sung that? Does any of the viewers know? Oh, yeah, that's uh, anybody in the comments know that one? I'm, oh, I've yeah, got to admit, I don't know that one myself. To see if they can remember United We Stand. It's a great song. Stand. Just can't remember the group, but I've, yeah, I've heard it many times at Gangrene Lane. I'll leave, it, I'll leave it in there for them so people can come back and tell us which. Uh, yeah, definitely. Which was. Um, so you've been a director for about four years at the club now. Um, what's that been like? Oh, it's, it's good. I've very enjoyed it, and um, I think it's, it's a different different aspect of, um, of football that's um, seen football from the director side, not being. You know, on the playing side, although I like to feel that I can, um, you know, keep, keep, keep with them and, and understand from their side of things. Um, so my inputs, I mean, I'm doing a lot of this pavilion thing for the uh, for Football Foundation, which is a fair brother has um, asked me to take on board, which has, has taken a lot of the time up, but it's uh, another aspect of the club, which being a player, you never... You don't see these things. You just go out and play, don't you? And when suddenly you're now having to do something for the club and work for the club, and um, so I'm committed to get that getting that done. Um, we've just got about the, the local authority, the council, to finalise the lease, and that would be a fantastic thing. Um, Arsenal will come down for that when the day does happen. Um, they've committed to themselves to to performing. Um, but we've obviously got to get it done, which is we're nearly, nearly there. I'm saying that for a little while now, but it's been a lot of, a lot of hard work. And um, there's obviously responsibilities with the club and, and how it's run in this level of football. And it's certainly an eye opener for me. But it's, it's you know, it's got some good people on that, on that uh, directorship, and uh, they're committed, they're dedicated to the club, and, and we'll get there. In the end, where we're trying to get to, um, at the moment we've got big, big challenges with this uh, this very sad situation we're in at the moment. But um, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's certainly a, a different aspect of the, of, of the football club, which is such an important aspect, and it's been so with Bruce in, in charge there and Dave Fair brother, um, we're going in the right direction. Um, We've got a few challenges ahead of us and we'll meet them head on and deal with them as we have to. 
Right, we've had a few answers come in. Uh, Tony Dolbert texted me saying Brotherhood of Man. James King said Brotherhood of Man. And also Mr. Jenkel said, yep, Brotherhood of Man. So okay, few I've people, few one, people sure have... I've thought, the, I've thought the boys for the, for the past week, yeah. But, uh, I've got a few other questions I could throw in, but um, I'll go back on the quiz one night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, Mickey, uh, that's it. Uh, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you, so... Plenty of fa fabulous tales you told me about the club, and it's it's been a pleasure speaking to you tonight, Mickey. And you've certainly entertained the viewers, uh, and especially ones in the live chat as well. So, uh, thank you very much for your time. Don't worry, I've got. Um, I'll find out their names on those few questions they've got. So, um, I'll be um, I'll be having their cards marked. So, don't worry. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> That's uh, good. No worries, Tom. Thanks, mate. Yeah. Thanks, fa thanks for speaking, Mickey. Together. That's yeah. Fantastic. Here we go, mate. Will do, yeah. Th thank you very much. All right, cool. All the best. All right. Okay, cheers, mate. Have a good bye, evening, bye, Mickey. Bye. Bye, bye. And you. Cheers, Tom. Well, that's it, guys. Uh, I, I really hope you all enjoyed that. I certainly have. I, I You know, Marvin, Marvin and Ricky were great to talk to uh, a week back, but uh, I've, I've got to admit, I, I think talking to Mickey Joyce might just uh, take the biscuit there. Um, so yeah, that, that's it for this evening. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in and getting your comments in the live chat. Uh, we fully appreciate that. Uh, let us know as well um, in the live chat now or on our Twitter at SJC TV in all caps or on the uh, Amber Planet forum on that as well about what legends you like on next or what guests would you like on next. And actually lastly as well, um, as uh, Joycey mentioned in the interview, um, again, uh, everyone at SJC TV, our um, our best wishes and uh, our condolences go to the family friends of Norman Hunter uh, and everyone at Leeds United as well. What what a centre back for me! Actually, I watched some clips today back of him. I'd say he's a centre back ahead of his time. Unbelievable player with the ball, and uh, Pierre yeah, great setting players down down the wing. And uh, you know, although actually uh, the, that Leeds side got a lot of criticism from the media, I, I have a soft spot for the side Don Revy created and Norman Hunter was certainly one of the greats. Part of the uh, 1966 World Cup squad, of course, as well. So, yeah, again, our thoughts and condolences uh, go out to everyone affected by Norman's passing. So that's it uh, for tonight, uh, guys. So uh, fully appreciate uh, you guys joining us. And, uh, yeah, we've got a... A show on Sunday for you guys, which I, I think uh, you'll certainly enjoy. So, um, yeah, we'll see you guys then.